And there's no better message of love than the one we receive in the Word of God. And so, it's a joy for us to be able to see God's love for us in His Word. But, some human writers have done pretty well too with expressing the love of God. In fact, one of the best-selling books of the 20th century and into the 21st century is The Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. I had read the book and then had an opportunity to meet him four or five years ago when he was here speaking for the Lifeline Family Center and uh, was just enthralled by his uh, speech that night. And so the next year in Vacation Bible School here, I taught through the five love languages and uh, one of the better attended Vacation Bible Schools we've ever had. Um, And I think it helps people. I think it's uh, probably the best book on um, marriage and love that I have ever read. So I would definitely recommend it to you because we all need to learn how to speak the languages of love. Now, I thought five was too many, and you know me, I like three and four point sermons, so I tried to pare it down just a tad today. But uh, I love the story author Don Locker tells about a a vivacious older woman in his congregation when she reached her mid-80s. She decided to enter a retirement home, and she had a number of friends who were already living at the retirement home, and they planned a beautiful banquet and really wanted to welcome her in the best way they could. They seated her at the place of honor at the head of the table, and immediately she noticed that sitting next to her was a very strikingly dignified, handsome man, probably also looked to be in his mid-80s. He was dressed in a suit and uh, just really looked like uh, he had his act together, and he had lived there for some time. And when she sat down beside him, she just stared and stared and stared at him until it became painfully obvious that she was staring at him. And finally, she said, forgive me for staring at you like that, but I just can't help it. You see, you look exactly like my third husband. And he said, oh, really? How many times have you been married? And with a twinkle in her eyes, she patted his hand and said, twice. (laughs) Now that's a woman that knows how to communicate. That's a woman that knows how to speak the language well, how to express love. Sadly, She's in the minority. The unfortunate fact is many people never, ever learn how to really speak the language of love. There is so much love in this world bottled up in the hearts of people who do not know how to express it, how to give it out, to other people. Most unhappy people I know, the most unhappy people I've known all of my life are experts at expressing their anger. They're experts at expressing their animosities. They are specialists in letting you know what they don't like. But how many people specialize in the language of love. It's not that hard. It's words. We say them all the time. So it can't be the words. It's got to be the emotions in the heart that aren't speaking the words. It has to be. Now, We see the expression of love so vividly in the story of Jesus. Reaching out to one of the most despised men in the Bible, Zacchaeus, a hated 
tax collector. And the story is so powerful, and I want to, I want to uh, imprint it on your brain, because they say a picture is worth a thousand words, that I'd rather watch the actual reading of the text today than read it in our Bibles or in our outlines. So watch carefully from the video Bible. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Well, the first thing that I want you to say about that is, indeed, it's true what we sang as kids. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, wasn't he? <laughs> the scriptures tell us that he wasn't only a wee little man, but he was a chief tax collector. Not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector, so he was over many of the other tax collectors, which meant he got to take even a portion of their cut. And he was very rich. And he was terribly disliked by the people of Jericho for a number of reasons. For one thing, Zacchaeus was responsible for gathering the hated Roman tax on the products of Jericho, particularly balsam. And so keep in mind, they were having to pay this Jewish man a tax as well as the Romans on their own product. Then they had to pay an incoming tax on the costly imports from Damascus and Arabia. So chief tax collectors in Jesus' day were considered outcasts and they were numbered with thieves and cutthroats. Zacchaeus was regarded by the people of Jericho as an absolute traitor. They hated him. Saw him as one who was betraying, really, his own people, his own nation, his own faith, and his own God. He was a turncoat, cashing in on their misfortunes. So they shunned him and rejected him. But he, like everybody else, had been hearing about Jesus and these miracles that he was performing. And so he runs to the crowd and he tries to see him, but he can't see him because the Bible says he's so short. So he runs ahead of the crowd, around the crowd, and he climbs up into a tree so that he will just be able to get a glimpse of this miracle worker. And as he's watching the miracle worker walk through the streets, Jesus was watching him. Who's trying to see who here? <laughs> Zacchaeus thought he was trying to see Jesus. Jesus knew he was a hated sinner. And Jesus really was trying to see Zacchaeus. And he spotted Zacchaeus up in that sycamore tree and he quickly sized up the situation, how perceptive he was. He felt the animosity towards Zacchaeus. And so he put his own reputation on the line. And out of his heart, he spoke words of love to this wicked tax collector. And he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must go to your home today. 
The highest compliment he could pay was say, I must go to your home today. Do you know that every single person who was in that crowd following Jesus, hundreds and hundreds of people would have loved for Jesus to have said to them, I'm going to your home today. But no. He picked the wicked tax collector instead. What? An evidence of love. And Zacchaeus overwhelmed by that expression of love, overwhelmed by the master's acceptance of him, touched powerfully, jumped down quickly and welcomed Jesus warmly. And because of that tender moment of grace and love, his whole life was changed. He said, I'll give back four times as much. So in other words, he probably went from very rich to pretty broke because love broke his heart in two. Now, I want you to notice in the text, Jesus did not give Zacchaeus any material gifts. He gave him something far better. Love, respect, and acceptance. How long do you think it had been since Zacchaeus had experienced any love from anybody? Real love. How long do you think it had been since Zacchaeus had experienced any respect from somebody else? Real respect. How long do you think it had been since Zacchaeus had experienced any acceptance from anybody else? People snarled at him as he walked by. They hated him. What must it feel like to go from being the most hated person in an entire area to being suddenly loved, accepted, respected, and appreciated? And Zacchaeus was so profoundly moved that his whole lifestyle was totally changed. I'll give back four times what I have frauded so that's what genuine love does. It changes our life. We receive God's love and then we have to pass it on to other people. We have to. And in our remaining few moments, I want to share with you three ways that we do that. Three of the languages of love. And the first one is an obvious one, and it's one Jesus here used in our text this morning, and that is words. Jesus went over and talked to Zacchaeus. He emphasized his love for him in words. It is so important, and yet so many people fail miserably here. They do not know how to speak the words of love. Some of you grew up in homes like I did with parents who had never been told they were loved themselves by their parents. Or you knew they loved you, but they never said it. They seemed almost embarrassed about it. Why is it that we're afraid to say the words? And so I was flipping through the TV channel a couple, three weeks ago, and an old movie came on, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, which starred Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, and, and uh, it's from the 1940s, and um, it's about an American marriage of a couple in Kansas City. Mr. Bridge is a banker and a crusty, old-style, old-world kind of guy, you might say, extremely reserved, has difficulty expressing himself, has difficulty with relationships, even with his uh, family. He's an elite person, an elite lawyer in Kansas City, but he's not elite at home. He's not elite in his relationships. He has difficulty expressing love for his wife and his children, and he tends to treat his obedient wife like a little child. He either indulges her or scolds her, and rather as treating her as an equal, he treats her like just another one of his children, that he doesn't speak much to either. 
And in one moment in the movie that I caught, they're in a bank and they're at the uh, a safety deposit box. And, and he's getting in the safety deposit box and his wife says, do you love me? And he said, well, of course I love you. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. And there's this pregnant pause. And she says, but couldn't you just tell me once in a while? Just once in a while. She hungers to hear it. She's desperate to hear it. She wants him to say it out loud and show that his love is alive and well. She needs to hear the words, I love you. Don't we all? Is there anybody that doesn't? So why are we so stingy? with words that can be so special. That's a mystery. It's a mystery to me. It's a mystery to God, I'm sure. We forget to say the words, or we neglect to say the words, or we refuse to say the words, or we don't know how to say the words. Or we have too much pride to say the words. Husbands and wives live together day in and day out. Surely they love each other. But has it been said lately? You see, one of the languages of love is words. Father and son, mother and daughter live together share the same blood and same genetics? Surely they love each other, but has it been said? Or is it just supposed to be assumed? Sister and brother, and I'm not just talking about in families, I'm also talking about in the church family, brothers and sisters in Christ in the church family. We sit in the same church, we live near one another, we attend the same Bible classes, we sit in the same pews, surely we love each other. But has it been verbalized at all? Look, I know some of you week by week get tired of the love feast that we have after the first song. And I know particularly some of you who sit around the same people every week get a little tired of it. But just keep in mind this. There are people who walk into this building every week who never touch another person all week other than during that one moment. There are widows and widowers who walk into this building at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning and never hear another person all week say, I love you, or touch them, or hug them until that moment. There are divorced people whose hearts have been crushed, who never hear anybody else say that or show it with any language of love until they walk into this building on Sunday at 10 a.m. and then have the opportunity to do it. Would I like to do away with the love feast after so many years? The answer to that is yes, I would. Am I willing to do away with it when there are so many who need to be told and shown that they are loved and have no other opportunity? No. It's so simple, yet so significant. Now, A moment of honesty. I grew up in a family that didn't hug. I grew up in a family that didn't say, I love you a lot. All my growing up years, all the way through childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood, I never remember a single time my mother or my father saying they loved me. I also never remember thinking they didn't because times were different, people were raised differently. 
the greatest predictor of how you will act as a, as a spouse or as a father or mother is how you were parented or how your parents did in their marriage. It's not always true, but it's the greatest predictor of it. And so I grew up in a home where there was not a lot of outward love spoken or shown. But thankfully, my parents lived long enough into the late 80s and then 90s and early 2000s, my mother, to where times had changed enough and people became more comfortable and more educated and more experienced with showing a little love. My father died early. He died at age 68. Sometimes that scares me. I'm 66. But the year that he died, I made a special trip and went on purpose and spent two weeks with him in Nashville in 1989. And I took him to my brother's house, and my brother and I both told him we loved him, and, and several times I told him I loved him. And in fact, the last thing I ever said to him before he died in June of 1989 was, I love you, Dad. And the last thing he ever said to me was, I love you, son. It was also one of the first times that he had ever said that. Now, there's poignancy in that, and there's beauty in that, but there's also a lot of wasted time and years in that. When we have available to us the language of love through words, why in the world would we not use it? So Jesus here in our text expressed love to Zacchaeus. And the impact was so potent that he was completely bowled over. His life turned upside down and inside out. Talk about a conversion. His greed and conceit gave way to the Spirit of Christ, and he proved it by his actions. That's what expressed love can do for a person. It can absolutely change his or her life in extraordinary ways. So let the love of Christ flow through you and out to others Express your love with words. If you need to say I love you to someone, don't wait any longer. Don't waste any more time. Don't wait till the end of your life like my dad did. Say it before the sun goes down tonight. Say it in the gracious spirit of Christ. Say it from the heart because love can be expressed with words, and it can also be expressed with touch. Time after time in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus expressing his love and concern with a tender touch. One of those times is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 8. Large crowds followed Jesus. As he came down the mountainside, suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Look, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him. And before we read about the healing, read about the blessing before the healing. Jesus reached out and touched him. You did not touch a leper, period. They lived outside of town. They lived in leper colonies. Their own family couldn't be near them. If they got anywhere close to somebody else, they had to start yelling as they were walking down the streets, unclean, unclean, and you, the pathway would just be like the Red Sea before Moses' parting. Now with Jesus, he loved this man. And so he reached out and touched him and said, I am willing, be healed and Instantly, the leprosy 
disappeared. I can just see Jesus giving his helping hand up to Zacchaeus, helping him down from the sycamore tree, walking with him toward his house, maybe putting his hand around his shoulder. On the way back, Jesus knew something that psychologists have come to understand over the years. There is tremendous power in the touch of love. My mother, in some ways, had a sad life. She, um, her father died when she was five years old, and then uh, in 1925, uh, I'm sorry, in 1929, and then in, she was born in 1924, he died in 1929 suddenly, and uh, then in 1930, their house burned to the ground, whole house burned to the ground. So my mother and my, my mother and her mother were homeless literally having to be shuffled around and taken in by other family members in poor rural central Tennessee. And when the house burned down, there was only one item that survived that house burning, and it was a picture and a bowl or a basin, uh, a, a beautiful white basin and bowl. And that basin and bowl sat in her house, the house I grew up in, my brother and I grew up in, the whole time we were there. And it was the one thing that was off limits in the house. You did not play near that basin. You did not play. And so every time our grandkids went up there, we were like forming a human shield around <laughs> the area where the basin was. I mean, it was like the gold in the house, the one treasure. And so, because I understand that, I love a story I read recently about a, a little preschool girl who was playing at home one day when she accidentally broke one of the family's most cherished heirlooms. It was an oriental vase that had been passed down from generation to generation in the family, so it had sentimental value, but it also was worth a lot of money. And because she knew its value when she broke it, she started crying and screaming and sat down beside it. And hearing the cry and the scream, the, her mother came running into the room, and the child was in for a big surprise. She thought she had had it. But she didn't see anger on her mother's eyes. She saw relief. Her mother said, oh, darling, darling, I thought you were hurt. And she gathered the little girl up into her loving arms and held her tightly and rocked her gently and hugged her and touched her and said, what happened? And she said, I'm sorry, Mom, but I leaned up against it and I broke it. And the mother just said, I'm just so glad you're not hurt. When I heard the crashing sound, I thought you were hurt. When that little girl grew up, she repeatedly told people everywhere that was the most important event of her life because she discovered that day that she was the family treasure. Not the oriental vase. She was the family treasure. She was what was most valuable. Oh, how love can be expressed through touch, a compassionate touch. And then finally, love can be expressed language-wise with actions. That day long ago in Jericho, Jesus went out on a limb for Zacchaeus, literally. <laughs> he went out on a limb for Zacchaeus. He knew he'd be criticized. He knew there would be people saying in the background, as they were, look at him, he's eating with sinners. Look at him, he's taking that cheating, conniving tax collector and going home with him. Look at him, he could not have picked any lower scum in all the earth to reach out to. He knew that. But for love's sake, he did it anyway. 
he paid the price and made the sacrifice. I read a story not too long ago about a college student from the South who was attending Harvard many years ago, back a uh, half century or more ago. Uh, a college student, a poor college student from the South who was attending prestigious Ivy League Harvard in Boston. And the young freshman was visited one weekend on Parents Weekend by his father who drove onto the university campus there in Boston in an old, dilapidated car. And when the father had left, some of the boy's classmates began to tease him a little bit, making fun of his father's old car. And the young man was having nothing of it. <laughs> he said, you can laugh if you want to, but let me tell you something. My dad could have had a new car. He chose not to. He had the money to buy it, but he wanted me to have an education at this school more than he wanted a new car for himself. And the only reason I'm here is because he chose to drive that old car. And I want you to know because of that, I love that old car. And I love that old man driving it too. Love sacrifices. with actions. There is nothing in this old world more Christ-like than when we act in sacrificial love. Nothing more Christ-like than that because that is how Christ acted. And we can express love with words as Jesus did, with touch, as Jesus did, and even more powerfully with actions, as Jesus did. Jesus showed us that day on the cross what sacrificial actions defines love. He had said just before going to the cross, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then within 72 hours, he had done that very thing. He had done that very thing. He showed us love in action on the cross. And on page after page of the Bible, the greatest message of the Scripture is the one that we sang today, the greatest commands, that we're to love God and we're to love one another. And so the Scriptures underscore and repeat over and over again, God is love. God loves us. May we love Him in return. And Jesus said, within that same 72-hour period before going to the cross. So if you love me, keep my commands, my actions. Keep my commands, my actions. And so, it's not enough to say we love somebody and not show it in our actions. It's not enough to say, well, I told you I loved you 40 years ago, and if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. I told you I loved you 44 years ago. If I ever change my mind, I'll let you go. 44 years. Is that, has it been that long? Well, how were you when we got married? Six Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> the language of love. The language of love. Jesus modeled it for us in words, in touch, and in actions. 
If we love Him, we'll keep His commandments and reciprocate by loving Him and others with words and with touch and with action.